Welcome to CX Wise, where we share wisdom, insights, stories, and expertise from the world of customer experience. I'm your host, Nathan Bennett, and you're about to hear real world experiences and practical advice that will elevate your CX game, no matter your title, no matter your industry. So without further ado, let's get wise. My guest today is Jay Baer, a digital pioneer and a true maven of customer experience and business strategy. He is a Hall of Fame keynote speaker and the author of seven New York Times bestsellers, all focused on marketing and customer experience. With an entrepreneurial spirit running through his blood for seven generations, Jay has founded five multi-million dollar companies. His wisdom has been sought after by over 700 brands, including Nike, Oracle, IBM, and the United Nations. Jay is also a certified barbecue judge, and during his leisure moments, he reigns as one of the most popular tequila influencers on the planet. Welcome to CXY's Jay. I hope we embarrassed you enough. Fantastic, Nate. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Looking forward to this uh, conversation. It's disappointing that we have neither barbecue nor tequila as part nor of today's tequila. program, but we'll, we'll persevere either way. Man, uh, okay, well, I will accept your invitation to that party. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll make it happen, yeah. yeah. Let's start off, uh, as all good conversations do, let's mm -hmm. start off with tequila. I'm really, really interested in what sparked your uh, fancy about this particular uh, beverage and why are you so passionate about it? And then we're going to find out what it means for customer experience today. It was sort of accidental. I'm from Arizona originally. I spent the first 40 years of my life there before I moved to the Midwest. And when I was a, a younger person in my 20s before I had kids, my good friend Tom and I would go each Wednesday to a restaurant in Scottsdale. I believe it's still there called Los Sombreros. And there was a, a bartender there. His name was Steve. And, and Wednesdays were a slow night. So Tom and I would just sit at the bar and get tacos. And Steve was super, super early into the mezcal world. And this is you know, 25 years ago, long before Mescal was a, a bartender's darling uh, all across the world. And and he would just kind of every week teach us something different and try this one and try this one and, uh, you know, bottles that had never been seen in the U.S. before. And he was bringing them in the trunk of his car and that kind of thing. And we just really fell in love with the, the romance of it and how uh, unique it is and, and the many, many, many different uh, flavor profiles in agave spirits. And so from there, over the next, you know, essentially almost three decades, I just started to learn more and more, visited tequila and mezcal production facilities and regions in Mexico. And a couple of years ago, I decided to start making videos, just hoping to educate people about agave spirits. And it kind of got popular. And all of a sudden, now I'm making 23 videos a month uh, and telling people all about the wonderful world of tequila. And where are these, uh, tell me how you're implementing these videos, what platforms mm -hmm. are you using, and what are you learning about customer experience from uh, those venues? Yeah, it's interesting. My career is obviously more on the B2B side, and I've done a lot of longer form B2B oriented content, podcasts, books, as you mentioned. So when I started doing the tequila stuff, this is sort of an experiment anyway. So why don't we try short form video content, TikTok and Reels, because I'd never really done that with any degree of consistency. And so I said, well, let's just see how that works. And it's very, very different, very consumer oriented, very short form content window is much different than how would you produce a podcast, for example. So learned a lot of lessons there. It's And it's actually been good because tequila brands – are mostly on Instagram more and more over time on TikTok. And you're finding quite a bit of success doing what you're doing in those short forms, like on Reels and on TikTok. Yeah. So I'm wondering what your advice would be for a B2B, let's say, a CMO who mm -hmm. wants to have that kind of presence as part of their social media strategy, but yeah. they're not convinced that these short form platforms like a TikTok or Reels or something like that are valuable and they shouldn't really invest resources into that medium. What would you say to that? I think the common concern about say TikTok or even at maybe a little bit of a lesser degree reels is that the audience is sort of too young to be a viable B2B uh, addressable audience. And that's just not really true. And it's becomes literally less true every day. 
I mean, every social network in the history of social networks started with youth. Twitter did the same thing. Facebook obviously famously started on college campuses. Instagram the same. Even LinkedIn was more popular amongst younger professionals because they understood the value of technology. So TikTok today uh, is still exhibiting explosive growth. And the fastest growing group on TikTok are people 40 plus. And so once you kind of get past the demographic um concerns, the question becomes, well, if you're going to be there, what are you adding to the fabric of any social network that makes it worth the time of the audience to participate with you? The the challenge that I see, especially for B2B in these more short form content opportunities is that they tend to get sucked into this random acts of content problem where, where they're just sort of like firing off content bullets in the air hoping a bird flies by simultaneously when and every day is like a totally different thing when when i owned my consulting firm we used to train brands on this premise of thinking like a television network right so hgtv's got a bunch of shows on that channel but they're all about h's and g's right it's all about homes and gardens and it's not like hey on the hgtv channel we're gonna have a documentary about feudal japan it's like that's weird that's super random they've got a consistent okay on tuesday nights this show is on and on wednesday nights this show is on and that's the best way to think about social content especially short form for b2b is like you are producing an episodic content show that needs to have a consistent point of view, a consistent cast of characters, and a consistent rationale for existing. And I think one of the one of the mistakes that folks can fall into when they think about a strategy for a social media is, well, we have to be able to explain everything we do in right. 60 right. seconds. Yeah. And one of the things that I love that you do with your platform specifically about tequila is you make each one informative. You've kind of created a user-friendly environment too, because if I want to find out about a specific bottle that I'm thinking yeah. about, I can easily find it's probably been reviewed by you. Yeah, it's actually a bit of a challenge in TikTok reels and those kind of short form places because you don't easily have a home base, right? It's not like you've got a website or a searchable directory of podcast episodes you know, it's a little ephemeral, right? And to that end, what we recently have done is published just a Google Doc that we update every day, tequilascores.com. And that doc is everything we've ever reviewed and what score we gave it. Because I was consistently getting messages from people saying, have you reviewed Milagro Reposado? I was like, yeah, scroll back and find that video. But if you're going to look at the thumbnail right. art to find the one that I did 14 months ago, it's just a really bad customer experience. So while it costs us a lot of video views to do it this way, from a CX perspective, it's much better for the audience to be like, look, we just put them all right here for you and that'll be easier. Oh, very, very smart. And one of the things I want to mention is your latest book, The Time to Win. You talk a lot about speed and how speed shows care for the customers. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could unpack that in a B2B sense. I did a huge research project on this before I wrote the book. So it doesn't matter if you're B2B or B2C. If you give your customers time, they will give you money. And if you cost your customers time, it will cost you money. It's because today, as you mentioned, we interpret responsiveness as respect. It's, it's just sort of modern humanity, at least in the West, that, that when a business responds to you more quickly, we internalize that as they care about us and our money and our happiness more. Ipso facto, we want to work with those people. Two thirds of customers now say that speed is as important as price. And I think when we have our customer hat on, we know that to be true. But very few businesses operate as if it were true. What I'm suggesting is that all businesses should elevate speed on their list of priorities because their customers already have. And on the B2B side, it's even more important because typically the average dollar value of a B2B customer is typically higher than the average dollar value of a B2C customer. Therefore, when you lose business because you weren't fast enough, the revenue implications for that can be quite significant. 50% of all customers will hire whomever contacts them first, regardless of price. Knowing that, wouldn't you just want to engineer your business to be first all the time? Seems like that would be a good idea. But when it comes to B2B, one of the 
bigger implications, even more so than just being fast, is to have a culture of responsiveness throughout the totality of the customer journey. Because 85% of customers now say that speed and responsiveness is a critical factor in their brand loyalty. So it's not just enough to be fast at the initial purchase. You've got to be fast all the time in every circumstance because eventually every customer is going to say, should I rebuy from those guys? Everybody has to revalidate the purchase at some point. And if you have been fast and responsive and essentially respectful during that relationship, then the chances of you getting the second order and the third order and the fourth order, which we all know is truly the key to growth in B2B, the chance of that reorder go way, way up. We've all heard under promise over deliver. But when it comes to responsiveness, so often we don't do that. We know it's going to take two weeks, but we tell the client it's going to take a week because we don't want to disappoint them at the point of inflection. We're like, yeah, we'll deal with that disappointment down the line. We just kick the can down the curb. That used to be satisfactory. But now that customers have elevated speed on their own list of priorities, you can't do that anymore. You can't fib to customers about responsiveness because they will be incredibly upset about it in a way that they didn't used to be because we all care about our time more than ever, which is the whole point of this book and this uh, line of thinking is that we value our time more than we used to. So one of the best things that B2B can do is there is a realistic amount of time that everything takes to get an invoice, to get a product, to get onboarded, whatever. There's a realistic amount of time that everything takes. Most B2B organizations are really, really bad at explaining that window of time to the customer. They just don't set expectations. So if you never set expectations, it is really, really difficult to exceed them. And if you don't tell a customer that this is going to take this long. We live in a culture now where left to their own devices, customers will assume everything can happen instantly. They will just assume that it can happen instantly unless you explain to them that's not the case and importantly, why that's the case. So most organizations would really benefit from some additional work around expectation setting, timeline communication, and buttressing that with some explanations around, well, why does it take five days? What happens during those five days? Are you actually doing things that add value to me as a customer? What you just explained sounds like a conversation that I have repeatedly with my two and a half year old son. We're going to understand the expectations of the amount of time this thing is going to happen. We rehearse that and we give them reasons why <laughs> it's going to take daddy five minutes to go to the kitchen and stop playing with trains with you. But daddy will be back. Daddy hasn't left. So I was sort of giggling to myself because my mind went directly to that's exactly how I communicate with my toddlers. Yeah, you can be a very successful business and not be super fast as long as the customers understand that. Right? As long as everybody is on the same page, I call that the uncertainty gap. The uncertainty gap is the difference between what you know about your business and your operations and what the customer knows. And we are in a world now where uncertainty gaps are being closed all the time, right? Uncertainty gaps are going away. You and I are old enough to remember before Uber and Lyft where to get transportation, you would have to telephone a taxi. Like yeah. use a payphone, you have to have a quarter and use a payphone to call a taxi. And and every taxi cab is two 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 two, right? Same number. Right. And you're just like two, 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 two. And this guy's like, just keep pressing two. And then this is Lou. I'm like, yeah, I gotta get to the airport. He'll be by to get you. Click. Yeah, that's all. When? Don't know. How much? Won't tell you. Which cab? They all look the same. Which one is yours? Yep. Don't know. No information. Now, of course, you've got like blood type and ancestry.com, you know, on the driver and you see an animation of the car. You know, it, there's no uncertainty, right? And so this is happening in every industry. And, and it's really smart to audit your own communication with your customers, especially once they've signed on in B2B in particular and say, okay. Where are what I call the information asynchronies, right? Information where we know more than they know. And how do we even that out? Because when people don't know what's going on, it creates a ton of anxiety. I mean, think about like I had to call my mobile phone company the other day, which I don't recommend. And luckily, though, they're like, hey, you know, we answer calls in the order that they're received, to which I always think, what other what other plan would you use? <laughs> it always confuses me. Like, why do we need to say that? Isn't that sort of inferred? So if you estimate a whole time is 11 minutes, 
First of all, if you pick up in 10 minutes, you're like doing cartwheels, right? Because they've exceeded expectations and they've right. set expectations, right? But if they don't tell you it's 11 minutes, you're like, we're going to get to you eventually. Even if it's 10 minutes, it feels like an hour. And that's the psychological power of the uncertainty gap, which you've got to get rid of. It's so funny, too, that you talked about it causes us anxiety because even as you're talking through your example about this cab, having been in that years and years and years ago, I started feeling anxiety just you telling me about it. Because I was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. I remember those days of just like not knowing. Those times when you like had to get to the airport and you just didn't know when your car was going to arrive. Yeah. Do I have enough money? Yeah, you have no idea. No yeah. idea. Psychologically damaging. But here we are. We've, we fought that, through. Here we are. And one of the things I want to call attention to too is that it's not just about the speed and the responsiveness of the response it's about the quality of yeah. that response as well you can get a fast response and still still be really really dis dissatisfied one of the things that you t that i heard you say a while ago was that emotion is first and information is second when it comes to responding mm -hmm. to especially uh, an issue that a customer might have. Can you unpack yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, a lot of times, especially in uh, B2B or complex industries, when you're in a sort of customer interaction scenario, and certainly in social, but even a reviews response, even face-to-face, -face, even in an email, even in a chat situation, live chat, not chat bot. But a lot of times what happens is we – use information as a weapon, as a shield, essentially, more so than a weapon, as a shield. And you see it in healthcare a lot. Customer has a question about, oh, I can't get my lab results or whatever. And the respondent uses a lot of details and acronyms and complex medical language. And, and they sort of throw up this whole smoke screen of, of intelligence. And it's very detailed and that's not what the customer is looking for, right? And in most cases, they don't actually want information. They want empathy. And so you can give them information, but you should always lead with empathy. In many cases, especially when they've got some sort of dismay, customers aren't looking for details. They just want you to say, oh, that sucks. We're sorry. And I think we overcomplicate it sometimes. But the best social customer care are human beings treating human beings like human beings. That's it, right? How would you deal with this person if they were sitting in your living room? Now, how can you do that digitally? That's really the assignment. And being able to do that at scale can be difficult, I understand. But sometimes we fall back into our lexicon, and that doesn't usually yield the desired outcome. I love that, by the way. And that kind of pivots into something else I want your viewpoint on. We talk about the humanity, the humanity, the humanity, the need for that human approach, human touch of empathy, which I totally agree with. However, as you well know, we're moving into a world where AI is being used more and more and more. So one of the other things that our state of social media report in uh, 2024 discovered that 70% of marketers in the US want to improve customer engagement and satisfaction. They want to do it using AI in the next six months. So how are we marrying those two things with using AI to increase our customer satisfaction and engagement and still bring the humanity? Yeah, my read on that is one of the ways you demonstrate humanity is with specificity, is by saying, I'm not gonna treat you as one of a million customers, I'm gonna treat you as one of one. I think it's funny, the word customers has the word custom inside of it. Yet so often we treat everybody the same. Isn't that ironic? So <laughs> I think we should come up with a different word. One of the things yeah. that I think AI is fantastic for, especially in Sprinkler's platform, because I've seen it work where it's really built into – it's not like you go over here to get yourself some AI, right? It's really built into every action, which is the way it should be in my estimation. Right. It, what it allows you to do is use generative AI tools – to deliver messages to customers that feel hyper relevant and hyper specific. And to me, that is a big part of humanity. Treat me like you actually know what I've bought from you and our relationship and what I need and where I've been. And in some cases, it's easier, faster, frankly, better to have AI spin that up than have a human go back, look through all the account history, and then conjure it from scratch. Certainly at scale, that's not really possible. So to me, the, the opportunity there is, is to use AI not necessarily for 
from what we think of from a language standpoint, because it's sometimes mm-hmm. difficult to train AI to, to have that tone, but to use AI to make it feel to every customer the way that they're the only customer you have, to me, that's the use case. Mm. I, I love that too, and it kind of brings to mind uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about. I love this term that I don't know if you coined it, but I love it, so I'm just going to attribute it to you, borderline personalization disorder. Mm-hmm. So how do we maintain the custom in customer without stepping over those boundaries and falling into that trap? The tricky part is that consumers today are pretty suspicious and probably rightfully so, and they can see pretty easily the stitching in the sofa cushion, right? They're like, oh, yeah, that, that is definitely a bot. Now, here's the good news, though when it comes to borderline personalization disorder, which is not mine, but I love it. The whole premise of AI is that it gets better over time. AI doesn't get worse. It doesn't work like that. Right. It, by definition, gets better. So are there going to be some awkward moments? For sure. Are there going to be some things that you use AI for that actually make it worse, not better? Definitely. But the same is true of... Twitter now X, the same is true of YouTube. I mean, you don't make omelets without breaking eggs. Like it ain't going to happen, right? So if your stated goal is we want to use AI to make our customers love us more with no collateral damage, you are crazy. It ain't going to happen. So no technology improves the lives of customers and businesses without some challenges along the way. Like who in the world has never had a frustrating chatbot experience. I've used chatbots where I'm like, this was not only a waste of time, but I now have a bigger problem than I had before, right? So I think that's true for almost everybody. Yet, on the whole, it's probably better for customers because you can get easy questions answered. It skims the cream off from the service team to handle more complex cases, all the things that we know to be true. So is it perfect? Nope. But is it on the whole better? Yes. And that's why I think you have to evaluate it. I want to pivot and talk about one of my favorite concepts that Jay Bear has brought to the forefront of Uh customer experience. And that is talk triggers. Mm -hmm. I am obsessed with this idea as a marketer and a brander. They're often small little details that a brand or a company gives to their customers that just sort of surprises and delights those customers so much so that they'll go and talk about it. They'll share it. It's word of mouth. It's often sort of free advertising. You've talked about the gigantic menu at Cheesecake Factory. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the little cookies at Doubletree Hotels. Can you unpack your talk triggers a little bit more, better than I did, and then talk about how brands can incorporate those things especially brands who maybe aren't a restaurant or maybe aren't yeah. in the hospitality industry, sure. like a B2B brand. How do we bring those things to the forefront? The best way to grow any business is for your customers to do it for you. This has always been true. This is still true today. If you can turn your customers into volunteer marketers, then it makes your company run much more effectively and much more cost efficiently. Everybody, I think, understands that word of mouth is important. I don't get a lot of argument on that point. But if you believe that word of mouth is important, referrals are important, inbound leads are important that come from current customers, what exactly is your strategy for creating those conversations? And the reality, Nate, is that there is none. John Jantz did a study on this and found that fewer than 1% of all businesses have an actual word of mouth strategy. Isn't that crazy? Because you got a strategy for everything else. You have a social media strategy, you got a CX strategy, you got a PR strategy, you got a hiring strategy, you got a ESG strategy, you got a whole shelf full of strategies. The one that you don't have is the one that's arguably the most important of all, which is what do people say about you and to whom? We just take it for granted. And the big mistake here that everybody makes, and the reason I wrote the book, is we've been erroneously taught that competency creates conversations. That if you just run a good business, people will naturally notice that and tell their friends. But they don't. Nobody does. It's not an interesting story to tell, and it's not an interesting story to hear. Hey, I bought this thing from a business. I got about what I thought I was going to get. You should do that too. That's what the money was for. 
This is why there's no three-star reviews, because why would you write a three-star review? There's no story there, right? Reviews are either one star, stay away, five stars, amazing. A talk trigger is defined as an operational choice that is designed to create conversations. So it's not really marketing, it's CX. Talk triggers are a CX initiative that creates huge marketing wins But it's really ops. It's not a campaign. It's not a slogan. It's not an influencer program. It's something that you do differently so that your customers will talk differently. And the thing that people have a hard time understanding, especially in B2B, is that your talk trigger cannot be the thing that you sell because that's what they paid for. That's not extra or different or special. So, for example, there's a plumber in Los Angeles Mike Diamond Plumbers, and they're a big business. So they certainly do some residential stuff, but they're a big enough shop. They do mostly commercial, right? And they've got trucks all over the greater Los Angeles. They have a talk trigger and the talk trigger is not clear your drains or we'll install better toilets in your office building because that's what plumbers do. No one's going to tell a story about that on the trucks and actually on the work shirts of every plumber. It says Mike Diamond Plumbers, the smell good plumbers have a house cologne it's unisex male or female wears and they keep their trucks really tidy and they've got like incense in their toolbox and the whole thing and if you look at their reviews first of all they have an unbelievable number of reviews for a plumber and second of all almost all the reviews say yeah he really did smell good that was amazing right (laughs) like that's a story you're gonna tell Right, You're not going to tell a story of drain clogged, drained, unclogged, because there's no drama there. But I'm like, Nate, I got a plumber today. You won't believe it. They've got their own cologne. It was gorgeous. Yeah. Selling it on their website, the whole thing. It's genius, right? It's an operational choice designed to create conversations. That's it. Because, you know, they're also battling a perception. Of course. They're battling a perception of, listen, you know, this particular person is a plumber. They work with a lot of stinky things. They're in often stinky situations. Yeah. I have a picture, a cartoon picture of what a plumber is when they come to my house or mm-hmm. my place of business. And they're fighting against that in the most brilliant way. That's just so smart. Yeah. I, I mean, that. and look, every any business can do it. There is no special sauce required. All you have to do is understand and appreciate the power of word of mouth, then come up with something that people will talk about. We, we kind of give you a whole process for how to do that in the book and then stick to it. That's it. You just have to want to do it, come up with something that makes sense and then do it consistently. It's not that hard, now, is this- but people choose to not do it because they think, well, why would we, we're not in the cologne business. We're in the plumbing business. So they get so wrapped around the axle about we can't talk about things that aren't our products or services. This is different, is it not, from your concept of utility, Y-O-U, the utility mindset where businesses provide value beyond their products Mm -hmm. and services. That's a different thing, right? Uh, Yes and no. So utility is more of a foundational communication approach, right? It's certainly rooted in content marketing, where instead of telling people that you're awesome, you should just give them things that make their life better, and they will discover that you're awesome, right? It requires a bit of patience. The way we talked about it in that book is that is that helping beats selling, that if you're incredibly helpful, eventually people will sell themselves on you. However, there are utility executions, which also are so good that they become talk triggers. I'll give you an example. So this is a talkably useful idea that is both hyper important for customers, but it's so good that it transcends just a content marketing assignment and has become something that customers tell each other about. Everybody in the world presumably has made pasta at some point. You boil water, you put the pasta in, you take it off and you drain the water and eat it. So the thing about dried pasta is that if you cook it perfectly, it's perfect. But if you cook it a little less, it's uh, not great. And if you cook it a little more, also not great. The, the, the window of excellence for dried pasta is relatively narrow. The other thing that people don't talk about enough is that there are a number of types of pasta. You got your spaghetti, your rigatoni, your penne, whatever. And each of those has different densities. So actually, you should cook them different times 
because they cook at a different rate. But people just say, like, when it boils, put it in there and ah, 10 minutes or so. They just kind of eyeball it and then they're disappointed. So Berea, the dried pasta company, was using a lot of social listening tools. And they realized that customers were like, man, how did I overcook dried pasta? Like, how I can't even make pasta. I mean, people were having like a, a crisis of confidence. So they picked this up in their word clouds and stuff like, wait a second. I think we can solve this with a utility execution. So now they have a series of playlists on Spotify. And it's like <laughs> playlist spaghetti, playlist rigatoni, playlist penne. So you boil the water, you put the pasta in, you hit play on the playlist. It's a whole bunch of cool Italian songs that they put together. The second the playlist is over, you take the pasta off and it's perfectly cooked. And they've got different playlists for each type of pasta that they make. And they've got hundreds of thousands of plays on each of these playlists. Now they talk about it on their packaging as well. And they direct people to the Spotify playlist to make sure they cook it perfectly. Like, isn't it great? So... Use social media, find a problem, solve the problem with useful content, but the content is so useful and so novel that then it becomes a word of mouth generator. Man, I, that is so smart. I love that. And that makes me want to go check them out. That's one of those things that, like, I don't really care which kind of pasta I get at the grocery store. I'm usually going to get whatever's cheapest or whatever my hand reaches for. But that might make me stop and go, wait a second. I like what they're doing. What they're doing is smart. I also want an interactive thing that I can yeah. participate in. So it hits me at all levels. I, I, I love that. It's so smart. So. I just always feel like, you know, customer experience is the best marketing. And I think people know that to be true. It's just sometimes difficult to make that work inside the organization. And if you're one of those people who are like, I want to do the kind of things that Jay's talking about, but I can't keep at it right? Eventually people in your organization are going to understand the power of CX and marketing working together. And if they don't find an organization that does, who values your opinions and your talents. I I love that. And that, that brings to mind one of the quotes that I heard you say in an interview that I love, you said, where everyone owns a robot, the strategist is king. Yeah. And you were talking about how some organizations view customer service or customer experience as a cost rather than an investment. What are some words to the wise that you, from Jay Bear, that you could give to heads of these companies who are wrongly viewing customer experience as a cost rather than an investment? Well, I mean, ultimately, customers are making buying decisions largely on experience because what really is your product advantage or your service advantage or your price advantage. And even if you have one, it's not sustainable. I mean, having a better mousetrap and keeping that advantage is very, very difficult at at the true product level. Now you may have a brand advantage, but that's very expensive to maintain. So ultimately the easiest way to differentiate and the easiest way to outperform competitors is by having an experiential advantage. And it seems perhaps counterintuitive, but you teed it up nicely, Nate, AI is not going to be your differentiator. And this is the thing that I keep talking to people about right now. I'm like, they keep thinking, well, we're going to use AI and and that's how we're going to be better than than our competition. I'm like, no, you're not because they're going to have AI too. It's not like you've got proprietary AI or you're the only ones in your category who have thought about using AI. Everybody is going to have the same robots. AI is actually the opposite of a differentiator. It's a leveler. It's a commoditization of business, not a differentiator. And that being the case, the better idea, the better experience will win. If two thirds of customers already say that speed is as important as price, why would you try to win on price when only one out of three customers care? So we have to think about what does it feel like to be a customer of this organization? And today, most customers expect a hassle. Just give them a haven. Man, I, I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> you can make, make one. Make one. Man, Jay, that is a great place to end our conversation. You have made us all CX wiser. Before we sign off, I do want to tell our listeners, we love to spread wisdom, the wisdom of our guests, especially at CX Wise. So if you have a takeaway from this conversation, Post it to social media, tag us with hashtag CXYs, and we will send you a copy of Jay's latest book, The Time to Win, How to Exceed Your Customer's Need for Speed. 
Jay Bear, thank you so much, my friend. It's always a pleasure. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody.